speak of all his wonders, glory in his holy name. But the heart of those who seek the Lord will be glad. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face continually. Remember his wonders which he has done, his wonders and the judgments done by his mouth. Why don't we open in a word of prayer this morning? Father, we are grateful to be in the house of the Lord with the family of God. We are grateful that we can come and worship you together, to unite our hearts together, and praise to our Lord and Savior. May you bless this service and all who attend. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King.
not be surprised. Well, he would be surprised if you clap. <laughs> feel free, whatever you feel, Lord. Uh, let's sing this wonderful song about uh, casting our minds to Calvary, where Jesus died for each of us.
This is being rabbit. So I know most men kind of like to sing like this. <laughs> so men, you're going to have to sing this time, all right? We need your voices. All of you, you know, i got to tell you a story before we sing it. <laughs> when I was at Bible school, one of my professors was <laughs> tone deaf. Literally very tone deaf. And he had no idea what he was singing. And I would sit beside him at the first time. I remember the first time I sat beside him at, at, at chapel service. And he said to me, he says, if you're a singer, you might not want to sit beside me. <laughs> all over the place. But you know what? He says, I'm coming to make a joyful sound to the Lord the best I can. And I'll tell you something, he was horrible. <laughs> but he's made a joyful noise to the Lord because he sang from his heart. So men, sing from your heart. All right? And ladies, support the men. He has shown me
to want to serve you here in Harland. Lord, we are grateful today that we have the privilege of our camp that we have supported over the years. Uh, what a tremendous blessing. And uh, we think of all the kids who have gone through the doors of that camp and how it has touched so many lives and how many kids have come to know you. What a blessing to be part of that ministry. And we think of our united missions that we give and all the folks that are helped through that, missionaries who serve you uh, here and abroad to uh, proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, to feed the hungry and needy. Lord, it is a blessing to be part of all these ministries that we share together. Lord, we are grateful, Father, uh, for uh, the opportunity to open the Word of God each week in freedom. Uh, and uh, for our country, we are grateful. We pray for our leaders in all the different levels and that they can be led by the Spirit of God, we pray. We are grateful, Lord, for this topic that we are looking at, and I pray that we would come with open hearts and minds to hear from you. Uh, Lord, this is one of those topics that if we have an opinion before we come, it is very hard to change uh, our, our thinking. Uh, even though we say we, we haven't got everything figured out in the Bible when it comes to changing something we may believe it is difficult. And I pray for your grace as we look together in this passage this morning, and that you would uh, just uh, open our hearts to be people of peace and love and caring, and to be blessing particularly the ladies as we uh, look at this passage this morning. We pray in Christ's name. <clears throat> All right, we're at 1 Corinthians this morning, chapter 14, and for the next, I don't know, however many weeks we go through, we're going to look at some of Paul's more difficult, or what appears to be more difficult teachings on this topic, and see what the Word of God is really saying. 1 Corinthians 14, and verses 34 and 35. The women are to keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are subject to themselves, just as the Lord also says. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. And we'll just stop there. We are going to look at a couple more passages later on, so keep your Bible handy. You know, as we begin this journey of the role of women in the church, uh, as what the scripture says, I need to make one thing clear to you. As I mentioned last week, my mind has changed on this uh, whole topic, and it came with tremendous struggle. It wasn't easy, I, mu I must say. But hear this, I didn't change my mind on the issue because the world has already accepted that women are equal to men. I changed my mind on the subject because I believe the Word of God is faithful and true and it stands the scrutiny of Scripture. We need to be careful not to allow society's cultural norms to override the Word of God. There's a big difference. Let the Word of God be your authority in life. And it seems in our culture, in many, in many churches, uh, are accepting the world's things as being okay and, and are and a, coming to the point where they're changing their mind about what Scripture says because of what society says. And that's what we need to guard against. We need to guard against uh, their arguments that the Bible is intolerant, that the Bible is racist, and so forth, and unloving. It is so far from the truth. Stand on the Word of God not the norms of the culture. I have yet to decide how many weeks we're going to give to this subject. Uh, but I have decided much of my outline for this series last week really was my introduction to the topic. And for the next two or three or four weeks, however long it takes, we're going to look at some of Paul's more difficult teachings like the one today where it seems to say very clearly women should be quiet. And then I want to end with a week of what the Bible truly teaches about women 
in, in ministry within the church. And if you are like I was, uh, all I can ask is that you pray and ask for God, the Spirit of God to soften your hearts to His words as we look at them together. We come to this text in 1 Corinthians. And it is one of those texts which I, <clears throat> in my former days, read and said, well, see here, all is very clear. The teachings of Scripture is very clear. Women need to be quiet in the church. But is that what the Bible is really teaching? Many men have used these verses over the years to certainly suppress women. They have used it to promote a hierarchical structure within uh, their home and within their church and even at their place of work. An old fellow by the name of Plutarch, who was around in 46 AD to 120 AD, writes some advice for young married couples of his day. And I just want to share it with you because it gives a picture into the life of times of when the apostles were around and what their thinking was in general towards women. It says this, not only the arm of the virtuous woman, but her speech as well ought to be not for the public, and she ought not to, uh, and she ought to be modest and guarded about saying anything in the hearing of outsiders, since it is an expression of herself. For a woman ought to do her talking either to her husband or through her husband. If they, women, subordinate themselves to their husbands, they are commanded, but if they want to have control, they cut a, a sorrier figure than the subjects of their control. It's been a battle for women throughout history to regain the place they so deserve in culture. And it brings us back to a passage we looked at last week in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, which says, A woman's desire shall be for her husband. And that simply meant, from now on, there's going to be a power struggle between the husband and the wife. So how do we deal with this passage? There has been a few different views on the interpretation of this passage, and we need to be aware of them in order for us to unpack them. First off, there was the traditional view that we take this verse at face value, and women should be silent in the church. And we still see that in some churches today, though I do believe, though I can't say with authority, that most churches today do not, do no longer support the claim that women should be silent. <coughs> Though there are still some, don't get me wrong. The second way people have dealt with this passage, and I confess this is going to sound really strange to your ears, and it may even bother you, but it seems to be the one for which most scholars today uh, support. It is to say that these two verses are not verses written by Paul. That these verses were inserted by some scribe later on in the margins of his writings and then put into scriptures. And the scribe was influenced by other passages of Paul and the scribe felt that these two verses needed to be inserted the scribe felt that certainly that is what Paul was getting at at the end of the day. And if this be true, that they are written by some scribe, just like you and I sit down and put something in the margin of your Bible, if that be true, then these passages certainly are not relevant or apply to us today in regards to the literal understanding that women should be silent. Now, I'm not going to take the time to unpack this point today because we simply do, do not have the time. And number two, I think it would be really difficult to wrap our heads around 
It takes a lot of spiritual depth and understanding of the Word of God to understand it and to accept it. And the third way people look at this text, and this is the one that I want to approach from today, is that Paul was addressing a particular church with a particular problem. And therefore, it is not a prescription forever and eternity, but a description of something that happened in his day. I think, and I could be wrong here, you know how you lose track of time in life. I think it was a year ago, or perhaps early this summer, I don't remember, that we saw in the, in the news that Halifax had made a push to remove the statue of Edward Cornwallis, the man who they attributed for founding Halifax as a nation. I don't know if it has been made official yet, but it certainly has been unofficially changed. We have changed our national anthem from all thy sons command to in all of us command. A few hundred years ago, the French communities of Nova Scotia were exiled to the deep south of the United States. I say that to remind us that culture changes. Of course, it was wrong for Edward Cornwallis to place a bounty on the heads of our First Nations people. To us, that sounds tra tragedy, just a tragedy that that was ever done. Of course, it was wrong to expel them to the United States. And as women today are equally serving in the military as men, as the men are, and laying down their lives for our country, why shouldn't we include in all of us command? In our text today, unless we understand the culture of what was going on, we will misinterpret what is being written here in 1 Corinthians. If we don't look into the past as to what was going on, why they did or said what they said, we can easily misinterpret it and take it at face value. Further, it contradicts Paul's other teachings about women and their ability to speak. For example, in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 4 to 13, Paul encourages women to pray and prophesy in the church. Well, if they're to be silent, how they, can they pray and prophesy in the church? In other passages, he encourages all people in all churches to come together with a, with a hymn in their hearts to, to praise the Lord, with a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue of interpretation. All people, including the women. Paul says, you can all prophesy. In many places, Paul teaches all can speak in tongues. Uh, just to be clear, that does, does mean all people will speak in tongues, that it is open to all to speak in tongues. These are the way the church actually functioned in the early days of Paul. Men and women were equally gifted and equally to share in worship. And there's more that I, I can share with you, but I want to save them for some other sermons yet to come. What we know about the life and times of Paul is that women were not well trained. They were not well educated. It was a rarity for a woman to be educated. I think Paul was addressing a particular group of people, addressing a particular problem where these women were speaking out of turn and saying things they shouldn't say. We know that the people of this day, they married young. The, young, the women of this day married very young. And they were often considered property of their fathers. And there was no such thing as romantic weddings as we have today. Uh, perhaps most were arranged even. Women didn't finish school and certainly didn't pursue higher education. And with all that being said, I doubt, uh, said, uh, uh, I no doubt believe there are exceptions to every rule. Sure, there's probably some who are well educated, don't get me wrong. But in this particular church, 
uneducated woman for saying things they should not be saying. And I am not making a judgment call upon their culture. It's just the way it was during this time. Of course, however, we would all strongly disagree with the way they live today. Just like we would disagree with Edward Cornwallis putting a bounty on natives' heads. Just like today we defend the rights of women to education, to marriage as their choice, and their ability to serve in the military. Therefore, it is argued that women in this church were being disruptive by asking inappropriate questions, causing dissensions within the church. And if that being the case, Paul's correction then makes sense. When Paul writes, just as the law says in this passage, obviously he's looking for support in the Old Testament. Now, I can't tell you exactly what Paul meant by referring to the law because to be honest, nobody knows for sure. The law to the Jew meant the first five books of the Old Testament. So how do you pick which verse or thoughts he was thinking of? We're not sure. So his exact purpose in using this statement is lost to us, to be honest. Some think it refers to that passage in Genesis, which I read earlier in last week, that your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. We looked at that last week and we learned that this is not a prescriptive statement again, but a descriptive statement. I think it makes sense then that Paul is silencing a particular group with a particular problem. <coughs> and again, it is not prescriptive, but descriptive. We know this from other passages which clearly show that women were indeed participating in the church even encouraged to participate in the church. And they were given the same gifts as men. They were equal in every sense. Nowhere does in the Bible does it say the men will be given these spiritual gifts and the women will be given these spiritual gifts. It doesn't say that anywhere in Scripture. That it's just that we would all receive the gifts of the Spirit. So I don't think Paul is saying women for all time should be silent in the church. If he did that, he would be contradicting everything else he writes about the role of women in the church in scriptures. I said earlier that it is possible uh, and probable actually, actually that these verses weren't in the original text. And again, I don't want to get into much detail about this because that would just simply open a whole can of worms I'm not prepared to deal, deal with today. Just let me say that it does make seem likely that these indeed were verses put in the margin by some copyists. Now the copyists were probably influenced by another passage that Paul wrote. Let me read it for you in 1 Timothy. If you want to turn there, you're welcome to. Timothy chapter 2. Check out what Paul writes in these verses. And this is the ver these are the verses that we assume the copyist was influenced by. Two verse, starting at verse 8. Therefore I want the men in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. Likewise, I want women to adore themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments but rather by means of good works, as is proper for a woman making a claim to godliness. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. <clears throat> but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve, and it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. But woman will be pr preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith, and love and sanctity and self-restraint. What do you do with that passage? <laughs> We're going to look at that. 
Not today. But we're going to look at that. So if you were a copyist, and you had that text in front of you, wouldn't it be easy for you to put that in the notes of your margin? Keep in mind, these people didn't have copyright laws like we have today. Keep in mind, these people didn't have photocopiers like we had today. They didn't have the printing press uh, like we have today. From our perspective, we can see how easily it is for a corruption, if you will, actually the technical term is an interpolation, was put into the text. And that brings a whole bunch of other arguments and problems. But that is for another time. Gordon Fee, who I don't know, probably none of you know, but he's a world-class scholar of our day, he's still living, and he is noted for writing probably the foremost commentary on 1 Corinthians. And he also believes that this is an interpolation, something that was put in there by a copyist. <coughs> Payne, the fellow that I quoted from last week, also refers to Fee even in his verses and saying that he is correct in this assumption. And suffice to say, even if you agree that Paul was addressing a specific uh, group of people for a specific situation, then a further argument is that they don't belong there in the first place. But they've been put there. God has seen to it that these verses are there, so we deal with them. If they don't believe, if they don't belong though, that their actual teachings are in question and we need to reinterpret them a different way. So either way, Paul is not limiting women throughout time. Either way, we'll probably look a little closer at this passage in 1 Timothy. That seems a little difficult to we'll see what's going on there. Indeed, the historical teaching of women needing to be silenced, well, it's just plain wrong. Galatians, I want you to turn with me to Galatians if you have your Bibles. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. This is key verse for this whole discussion. Galatians 3, verse 28. For there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male or female. For you are all one. In Christ Jesus. We are all one in Christ Jesus. In Christ we have been restored to the pre-fall condition. That does not mean, however, that we are free from those consequences of the fall. Therefore we are still battling, but we are one in Jesus Christ. So what can we take away from this today? Let me suggest a couple of things this morning. First off, in the church, the spiritual gifts of women and men are to be recognized. They are to be developed and served in serving the teaching ministries at all levels in our church. As small group leaders, as counselors, as facilitators, administrators, ushers, communion servers, board members, pastor, hotel, teaching, preaching, and worship. Women belong everywhere just as the men do. And in doing so, you need to hear this, in doing so, the church honors God as the source of the one who gives spiritual gifts. The church will fulfill God's mandate of stewardship without the appalling loss of God's kingdom that results when half of its church members are excluded from positions of responsibility. And then, and second, in the church, public recognition is to be given to both men and women who exercise ministry of service and leadership. And in so doing, the church will model the unity and harmony that should characterize the community of believers. In a world fractured by discrimination and segregation, the church will uh, disassociate itself from worldly or pagan devices designed to make women feel inferior just for being female. It will help prevent their departure from the church 
or the rejection of the Christian faith. So let us move forward with equality in our minds and our hearts. Because I truly believe that is the way God has ordained it. Women are gifted equally for the same gifts as men. How dare us stifle God's blessing to the church by taking a very questionable text like this one in 1 Corinthians and making it a prescriptive statement. As we move forward, let us welcome women in all manners of our church affairs to the honor and glory of God. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for the blessing of the two genders that both are a reflection of your glory. Neither of us are the fulfillment. Only you are the fullness of male and female. Thank you that you have called us both, that you have gifted us both. And may we embrace the gifts you have given to women to serve you right here in our church. May it be a place of welcomeness and freedom to serve for all ladies. We pray in Christ's name. And to sing our closing again this morning. <laughs>